Good morning. So I am back with my friend and coworker Mitzi Williams. We both work in critical care and we were talking the other day about all the NP students that we've had over the years and we've had a lot. She's had a lot more than I've had, but we've had a lot of all different caliber. And I think it warrants a discussion about what makes for a great NP student. These are, you know, tips designed to help, not meant to criticize, but to help, to help build you up. I know that when I was going into clinicals, I would have loved a roadmap for what to do and what not to do and what they see kind of a behind the scenes on what happens in preceptorships. So in this video, we're gonna talk about what qualities we think makes for a great NP student. If we haven't met yet, my name is Bree. I'm an RN and NP mentor, interview strategist, and content creator. Welcome to the channel. Okay, before we get started, I gotta say, this video is not intended to criticize, it's not intended to tear down or come across as condescending. I think sometimes a little bit of tough love is warranted, a little bit of, um, not strong words, but a, a little bit of direct words to help let you know what is professional, what is not professional, what is expected. So here's just some tips and things that we've garnered over the years about the students who have really impressed us and those that have not been so impressive. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I want to say first and foremost is that we both really adore precepting. We like love teaching it. in this role. We say all this from a place of love. <laughs> That's the point I'm getting at here. Friends. So I think I'm going to approach this from a standpoint of things that I think people like qual qualities that make up a great MP student, things that make people stand out. And as we go along, I'm going to star the things that are super rare and make you very unique. Uh, we're also include a little bit of what not to do because you have to hear that in order to know what to do. Mm -hmm. So here we go. <laughs> Put on your bootstraps. This is going to be a hard one to watch. <laughs> it's tough. Sorry. <laughs> tough love, friends. Tough love. So let's start out with professionalism. So qualities that you think make for a professional MP student. Some of these things are obvious, right? Show up on time. It's okay. It's big. We have to say it because it doesn't always happen. <laughs> you should be asking your preceptor before the rotation starts, where do I need to be? What time do I need to be there? Mm -hmm. What do I need to bring with me? Those are good questions to ask the preceptor before the rotation starts. Valid, yeah. It's, it's important good. because, particularly in our role, but I think in generally any practice that you go into, the beginning of the shift starts with sign out. It starts with what happened before and what needs to be done today. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different in clinic, but even still, I mean, for obvious reasons, you should be on time there. But if you miss sign out in, in um, any kind of inpatient rotation, you're missing the bulk of what you need to know in order to take care of your patient that day. So it's really, really important. Call outs and date changes and a little bit of background on why that is challenging as the preceptor. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that most of you are working while you were going through school and some of you are doing multiple clinical rotations. That's what I did too. So it can be challenging to get all of your hours in. Um, but if you are, con and, I, and I'm talking about excessiveness, I'm not talking about the normal. It's right. expected that you're going to have days where you can't come in, you're sick, a kid's sick, something's going on. Totally, totally reasonable. It's the excessiveness. Um, in general, most of the things we're talking about, we're talking about in excess. Correct. So it is rare, but it does happen that you have a student who does things excessively, and we have to have discussions about why this is not professional. But, you know, we've had students in the past that will constantly change dates or constantly just not show up or call out. And <clears throat> for us, we're keeping our schedule the way it is in part to meet your needs. But if I was, because we're a small group, if I was requested to switch to a night or to another day, I'm not gonna be able to because my commitment is to you. So if my commitment is to you, I expect that your commitment is to me. So for the most part, you should show up on the dates that we agree upon. Yeah, I agree. And again, we're, we are human, we're yeah. moms, um, and we all understand that life is happening outside of school. None of us are under the impression that School is the center of your life. Uh, you know, most rotations are 12 weeks long. If you call out five times in that 12 week time, we've lost a lot of time. Yeah, and it's hard to make it back up. Sure. And along those lines, <clears throat> we will try to find a backup preceptor for you, but this isn't always possible. And so, Preceptor shopping, as I call it, where you are walking around our group asking other people to take you is sort of outstepping the bounds of your role. Um, and there may be reasons why I don't want you to go with another preceptor. There may be identified learning objectives or things that I don't think that person's gonna be able to meet. That is unprofessional behavior. 
Another important piece is to talk about your scope as an NP student. The role that you are in this rotation for is as an NP student. It's not as a nurse mm -hmm. and it's not as an NP. It's a, fine, it's, a, it's a gray area. I get it. You're like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing here. But, and again, talking ex on, in extremes, there it is rare, but we will have students who are far extending what they should be doing as an NP student, giving orders that we haven't discussed mm -hmm. already. Offering to do procedures when we haven't already talked about it to another person, like going to a physician and say, hey, can I do your line or something like that? That's not really okay if we haven't already done it together because I need to assess, have you done your lab? Have you watched me do it a couple of times? Is this a safe person to do a procedure on? Understanding that there is great risk with all of the things that we do in critical care, great risk. So I, we have to assess all of the factors, the risk to the patient, the risk to my license, the risk to you, the risk to the physician who is overseeing us. All of these things come into play. So sometimes you will have students who really, really push hard for procedures. And just please don't take it personally if it's not offered to you or it's declined. There is a reason for it. By all means, we try and get as many procedures in as we can. I know when I was a student, I really wanted to do procedures too. I think that's a natural thing to want to do that. Just understand there are reasons why it may not be available to you. Right. And also, we may be working on something behind the scenes that you're not aware of. If you um, have left me to go out and um, observe patients or, or follow someone else and do this, fine, go learn. If I'm not actively doing something, you know, we've discussed it, you want to go uh, kind of watch how things are happening in the unit. But I'm totally good with that. But what you may not know is on the back side, if you've left me and I've accepted an admission that we're about to go work on together and suddenly I find out you have volunteered to do something without my presence, oh gosh, I'm in a tough position because now I'm going to tell you no and we're going to go do something else. And so um, I think it's really difficult if students step away and volunteer for things uh, away yeah. from us being aware that yeah. that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, just being aware of your scope. Also on the other end of that spectrum, talking about not practicing as a nurse, this is something we see commonly. Mm -hmm. um, you're very uncomfortable. I fell into this too. You're coming into too. this and particularly your first rotation, you don't know how to act as a nurse practitioner. You're not entirely sure what your role is. So the default, the easy thing is to fall into the role as a nurse. It's to go into the room and it's to help turn the patient, to help clean them up, to help bring them a glass of water, do those things. I get that and I think it's admirable. I don't want you spending your time doing that though because your time while you're with us is better spent learning how to practice as an NP. So even though you're uncomfortable, don't fall into the nursing roles. Your role at that time is to help go find the tech, to go help find the nurse and offer to help them if you have time, but to not let that delay your focus on what you're supposed to be doing, which is assessing, making a treatment plan and following through with that plan. That's what you're there to do. And also one thing we've talked about is a lot of times students fall into that default role when things are getting tough. Yes. Things are getting dicey. I don't really know how to behave in this position. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what I'm going to do. The patient is changing quickly. So it's easy to remove yourself and fall into that role that's comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so if you find yourself doing that, ask yourself, why am I falling into this role as the bedside nurse? Um, am I avoiding something? Am I yeah. avoiding learning? Am I avoiding talking about something that's difficult? Or am I avoiding a difficult situation? Yeah. Hey friends, sorry I wanted to take a moment away from your video and talk to you about some of the challenges that I faced when I was transitioning to becoming a nurse practitioner. Everything from deciding whether or not I could go back to school to where I should go to school to what I should specialize in really struggled with that phase of life. There were no professional mentors to help guide me. I also struggled with my onboarding. I started with a very busy practice. I was expected to roll with the punches despite my orientation phase. I really struggled with it and I stayed late every day for four months just trying to get my notes done. This changed once I recognized the power of using dot phrases and automating my work. I created a business, I have a website. I would love it if you would go check it out and see what services I have that could help you in your unique set of problems. One-on-one -on -one consultation services, I'd love it if you'd look into my book. This is the book I wanted when I was new and when I was a student. It's uh, the Ultimate HMP Cheat Sheet, a copy of the 12 most common ICU problems with plans and templates. So it's like a copy that you can put in your EMR and your dot phrase, as well as a behind the scenes on what I teach my students. So a little bit of how we make the diagnosis and what the pertinents are. I also have noticed as an NP in a competitive market, in a program that interviews people a lot, when we have an open position, we can interview anywhere from five to 10 people, y'all. 
And apples to apples with the same level of experience and not knowing you, if you're coming in and you are unknown to us, the person who interviews the best is gonna get the job, period. Period. Because people hire for personality. Believe it. And the way you let your personality shine is by preparing and practicing your interview skills. What better way to do that than with a person who does this all the time in the profession that you're looking to join? So when you sign up for a mock interview with me, I am going to hand tailor a set of questions uniquely designed to target your weaknesses within the field that you're looking to go into. So we're gonna do 30 to 45 minutes of questions followed by 15 to 30 minutes of review so that you can hone your skills, continue to practice, and when you go in for your interview, you can feel confident and let your personality shine. And this, friends, is what's gonna get you job offers. So if you've been going to interviews and not getting offers, this is likely the reason. This has the power to reap massive rewards. The last thing I wanna say about professionalism is just <clears throat> asking you to realize that Everything that you do as an NP student reflects upon me and reflects reflects upon our service. Mm -hmm. So how you communicate with others, um, the things that you say to the patients, the other services, everybody in the hospital is representative of me. So um, I'm trying to think of the right words to say this because the default is just say know your place. That, that sounds very condescending. That's not necessarily what I mean. It just kind of goes back to that understanding what your scope and what your role is at that time. There are times when I'm going to push you and I'm going to need you to be independent and communicate with others. Just recognize that you're representing me when you do that. Yeah, I don't think there's much to add to that. Speaking professionally, um, identifying who you are and what your role is if the person you're talking to doesn't already know that and saying, hey, I'm a student, I'm working yeah. with Bree today, and I'm calling you because X, Y, Z, um, but speaking in a professional manner. Sure, 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 sure. I think it, this kind of becomes a problem when we have students who work in our facility because they're very comfortable. They're very comfortable with, they know a lot of people, they already have relationships established, and so sometimes it can be confusing to the people who are receiving these calls or receiving this communication, like, wait, you're, what are you doing? So clearly saying, hey, I'm acting as an NP student today with, with Mitzi and this is what we want to do. Uh, so now we're going to move on to communication. Being open about your thoughts, what your needs are, and being able to verbalize that is important. I feel like a lot of people come in very, very timid and very scared, which again is natural, mm -hmm. but we need to be able to communicate with each other. And you brought up a really good point about learning styles. Yeah, so I think it's really important early in the rotation for the preceptor and the student to openly communicate communicate about learning style. Tell me what you need. Um, some students, I'd say most students will say that they learn best by doing. Sure. Totally sure. good. So let's do these things together. Let's do an H&P together. Um, honestly, notes. Really find that most students struggle the most with a complete but concise note. How do I get all the pertinent information about this patient and their presentation into a note that's short enough people are willing to read it? So if notes are your biggest problem and the way you learn best is by doing, then let's do a bunch of notes together. But if you learn best by reading, then I, let's find some good reading mm -hmm. material for you sure. to augment what we're doing in the clinical scenario. Yeah. Yeah. If you learn best by repeating the information back, I can accommodate mm -hmm. that, right? Let's talk about it. Let's walk through how to do a particular topic and then I'm gonna give you an opportunity to repeat it back to me. Yeah. So let's talk about how do you learn best and how can I support your learning best? Because really, so at the end of our rotation, have our patients received excellent care and are our patients safe? But at the end of it, have you learned? Do you feel like you have grown as a nurse practitioner student and do you feel like you can do something better now than you could when you got to us? Yeah. My goal is not for you to be an independent nurse practitioner when you leave my rotation. Mm -hmm. Uh, my goal is not for you to be excellent at all things. We're, we're not going to accomplish that. We're together 12 weeks. But can you do something better now than you could when you got to me? And did we take excellent care of our patients in the meantime? Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good way to word that. I, piggybacking on that, probably the best student I ever had started out by telling me, I know I'm repeating myself a lot. This is how I process information. So if this gets too much for you, let me know. But when you teach me something new, is it okay if I repeat it back to you in my own words? That open communication allowed us both to meet each other's needs. And the growth I saw because she was vulnerable enough to tell me that was astronomical. Mm -hmm. So just have a little trust and put yourself out there that 
um, communicating what I need is valuable to them as well as to me. We are going to push you, okay? And and not all preceptors are created the same. Some are different. We probably do things completely different. I think we both have the philosophy that when you come to work with us as a student, I'm going to expect you to do things. This is not a shadow. We're going to push you to do things that you may not be comfortable with. I expect that it's going to be uncomfortable for you, and it should be uncomfortable for a reason. But there's a fine line between what's uncomfortable and what's unsafe. So I need you to feel comfortable in saying... I am beyond uncomfortable with this and this makes me scared and this is why. So that we can assess if that's a valid reason and we should push past it or if it's unsafe for the patient or for you. So the last thing I wanna talk about in regards to communication is feedback. Um, I know that when I was a brand new NP, I craved feedback. I, mm -hmm. I really, yes. really, really wanted someone to tell me how I was doing. I don't feel like I got enough of that. but. I try really hard as a preceptor, and I know you do as well, to const be constantly giving feedback. And I know from receiving feedback, it's hard, it's tough. Um, it's just important to recognize that we do this in order to help you grow and not to beat you down. It's not to um, push you to beyond your pain points and to make you feel bad about yourself. It is to help you grow. Growth comes from a place, from very low places. It starts at rock bottom and works its way up. So is necessary. So just not being too overly defensive when it comes to receiving feedback. Being willing to learn things that you didn't think you needed to learn. If you go into a student rotation believing that you already know it all, mm. you are dangerous. That's true. So recognizing that even if you've been a nurse in a location for a long time, even if you have experience with a particular diagnosis or procedure, still be open to hearing that things might be different than you've experienced in the past, be willing to learn. I'm willing to learn. If you have something to teach me, let's talk about it and mm -hmm. look it up together. I want to learn too. Um, but I need a student that's willing to learn. Yeah. If you come in believing you already know it all, we don't have anything. I don't have anything to offer you. Yeah, there are um, students who come in who know for a fact they don't want to do critical care. And so this is just yeah. checking a box for them and Here's my feedback on that. I did a ton of rotations that I knew I wasn't going to go into, but I went in and faked it <laughs> because people want to know that what they're teaching you is valuable and pe people love to talk about themselves and what they do. And if you were just an um, actively engaged listener, you would be amazed at how much more respect you will be given. Um, so coming in already with an attitude of, I just need to get my hours done, which happens, mm -hmm. uh, it makes for a less desirable student. I'll just leave it at that. It does, and there's always something to learn in that rotation, regardless of where you're gonna find yourself in the future. There's always something to learn that's gonna benefit, right? I, I need to know stuff about vascular surgery. Yeah. If you're doing a critical care rotation, but you know that your future is not critical care, I, I, I still feel like I have a lot that I can lend to you that is yeah. gonna benefit your future patients. Yeah. Be engaged. And that segues to our next point, which is engagement. That's probably the number one trait, I think, for a quality NP student. And yeah. something that we look for is your level of engagement. We've had students that have come through, um, again, same scenario, just checking off the box. They expect to shadow. You are never, <laughs> you are never going to shadow if you're with us. That is not learning, friends. That is following someone, someone around and getting your hours done. You have learned nothing at the end of that. Shadowing should never, 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 never be acceptable. It should not. Now, if you're doing a procedure heavy, where it is like strictly procedures, there's gonna be a time frame where you're gonna be doing a mm -hmm. lot of watching. But there's a difference between shadowing and actively engaged watching in preparation for you doing this. Um, there's just been enough students that we've seen come through that are honestly like bumps on a log. Um, number one, what are you doing to yourself and your future for your learning style? But also what reputation are you putting out there in the world? You are letting everybody around you know that you don't wanna be there and it's gonna filter down to all the other, we all talk, right? So we all pass students around. So everybody in that hospital knows that you don't wanna be there and that you are not an actively engaged participant in your learning. So the, rec the word's gonna get out and it's gonna be hard for you to find a job. It's just the reality. Yeah, rotation is, is a working interview, mm -hmm. right? I said it before, I cannot say strongly enough how much clinical rotations lead to future jobs. Sure. So sure. it is a working interview. 
Um, everybody has off days. It's okay to admit I'm having an off day, but the statement, is it okay if I just sit here in the office and read while you go do that is it's no. not okay. No. I typically will start my day and we'll do sign out. I'll give um, an assignment of patients or patient to my student. My expectation is that independently of me, now we're not talking about the first day, but beyond right. that, we are going to break off. You, we need to function sort of independently so that I can assess what you're doing and, and what I need to do to augment your learning. If you're stuck at the hip to me and you're doing everything I'm doing, you're not getting as much out of that. Um, it's sort of that I'm scared, so I'm going to pull into myself and, and just be attached to the person who knows what they're doing. It doesn't help you. So my expectation is we're going to break off. You're going to see the patient independently from me. You're going to do your own workup. You're going to look up your own labs and dig through the chart and form your own assessment of your diagnosis and make an independent plan. You're going to assess the patient independently of me. You're going to talk to the nurse independently of me. But I find that many, many students struggle with this. This is probably the biggest pain point is that they want to do it with me, which is okay to do initially. But beyond that, you have to do this independently so I can figure out what it is you are and aren't doing so we can make those changes and help you grow. Do you ever ask your students to look things up and come back the next day and discuss them? Yes. I'm probably a little ADD, so I probably don't do it as well as you. <laughs> Sometimes it is, hey, can you look this up and let's discuss it in a second. Yeah. A lot of times it's in the heat of the moment. Yeah. Um, I uh, Sometimes if they ask me a question, uh, it may be that I need to tackle another task mm -hmm. in the minute. And so what I may do is say, why don't we do this? I need to tackle this right this minute. Why don't you take a look at this? I'm going to tackle this task. Let's get back together and discuss mm -hmm. what you have found. And then I'll tell you how I approach. You know what? That that's issue. actually, that's good. Um, Cause I don't do that and I probably should start doing that. And I do a terrible job asking them to look up something that night and talk about it the yeah. next day. So we probably do So this I do that. Night. And what I find is that nine times out of 10, if I say, all right, go home and look up a TAPSI, come back in the morning and be prepared to tell me what a TAPSI is. Nine times out of 10, nobody does it. Either they did look it up and they're just uncomfortable talking about it the next day or they forgot it, they don't bring it up. Halfway through the day, I have to say, hey, did you read about TAPSI? And let me just say, I get it. I know that you're in school. I know that you have tests going on. I know that you're probably still working. I know you probably got a family. You were in a lot of different roles. But a big piece of a top tier quality NP student is somebody who doesn't let all of those other roles impede upon their clinical time. When they're with me, they let me know they're with me. I'm here, I'm in this moment actively learning. And if you tell me to read about TAPSI, I'm gonna read about it, even if I only have time to listen to a podcast about it when I'm driving into work. And then I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna say, hey, when you have time, can we talk about TAPSI later today? I've had very few people do that. And let me just tell you, those are the ones who stand out. Those are the ones that when a role opens up, you go, this was a great NP student. Maybe we should ask her if she wants to interview. Mm -hmm. This is somebody who, that is above and beyond. That is somebody who tells me they truly want to do this work and they're engaged in advancing their education about it. And that is rare, friends. So that is one of the key points to me is engagement to that level. So distractions, limiting distractions. So what do you find distracts students the most? So... Probably the number one distraction is uh, students that are from our hospital system that revert to socialization, yes. finding a professional balance mm -hmm. between um, if we are in the middle of rounds, I like for my students to participate in all of rounds, not just our students. Yeah, me too. I like students to participate in every patient that is in our area for rounds because I think there's a lot that you glean from hearing the pathophysiology of every patient and the plan and how it was developed, whether that's a resident or whether it's the physician's patient or whether it's our patient. So I really like for us to be engaged as much as possible um, with all of rounds. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a time and a place for socialization. Don't, don't get me wrong. Let's take a breather, right? We do not need to be um, engaged in acute critical care discussions for 12 hours straight. My brain can't do it. No, I cannot do absolutely. it. So we are going to take small little mm -hmm. breaks, and that's professionally acceptable. But when it's time to be engaged, let's be engaged. Uh, and if uh, coworkers or side conversations start to break out, there's something to say with, can 
I tell you what, let's plan for a two o'clock coffee and come back and I want to hear all about your vacation last week. Right now, I need to participate in what's happening over yeah. here. So there's a professional way to do it that's not rude and we can we can still make those side conversations happen. But engagement over socialization. For sure. And I see this with, um, I've had a student before that this was a re- a problem like I would ask this person to go okay I need you to go assess this patient and figure out if like if I get a call halfway through the day a new patient that we need to assess very rapidly and I am actively doing something that has to be finished and I may say go check this patient out let me know what you think and then I get over there and this person is chit-chatting with nurses in the hallway which again may not be a problem but when I say hey what did you find out oh well I mean I haven't really seen the patient yet but I was talking to the nurse who said that blah 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 and it's nothing helpful, but they, when I came up, they were talking about personal stuff. Like, that's not appropriate. That's not appropriate. Your job in that moment is to assess the patient and determine if we have a critical critical need. And I, I expect that you would do that. And most people do, but there are people who don't. <laughs> so again, and I, I feel like it comes from a place of, I don't know what to do. So therefore I'm gonna default to doing nothing. And that's what you're doing. And that's what you're putting out into the world. That's the impression you're giving me. And uh, personal phone calls, which this has only ever happened to me once. Um, but again, I say it because it's happened to me before. Excessive phone calls during the day. I'm not talking about, you know, three, four a day. I'm talking about a lot. I'm talking about you and I are having a, a deep discussion about something. Oh, hold on. So-and-so's calling. And you pick up the phone. What? <laughs> like that to me that is disrespectful of my time and my energy i'm taking time away from my tasks and taking care of my patients and my work to teach you mm-hmm. i expect that you're going to respect that time um this is a terrible impression this is a terrible impression your priority should not be to your outside friends and family at that moment obviously there are circumstances that warrant it i'm not saying i just, you know i'm going to have those moments too but it should not be excessive it shouldn't yeah, I agree. I've had very few instances where I felt like it was, ex- it was excessive. So tell me, if there's something happening in your personal life and it warrants yeah. the, an, an, an issue that you need to take frequent breaks from what we're doing, let's talk it out. So expectations um, in regards to engagement. We've already talked about shadowing, that the expectation is not that you're shadow, going to shadow. Beyond that, I'm going to expect that you present this patient typically in rounds Mm -hmm. to everyone, but if not, at least to me. You need to get very, very good at presenting patients because you're gonna have to do this all the time. As an NP, it doesn't matter what specialty you're in, you're gonna have to have the ability to present a patient. Now within specialties, you're gonna have differences and nuances, right? Some places it's gonna be much more concise, just um, one organ system specific versus you know critical care or hospital service is going to be very broad Mm -hmm. but you have to be able to concisely um get to the point (laughs) you have to be able to make that transition from nursing presentation where you talk about all the itty bitty details to what is my diagnosis and how did i arrive to these diagnoses and what's my plan for that day and it's hard it's hard it was hard for me it was hard for her it was hard for everybody who's become an np you're not going to get there unless you start doing it. Quite often, you have to do it in front of a crowd. There are going to be a lot of residents. There are going to be a lot of nurses. There are going to be attendings. It's going to feel very uncomfortable. You know, and as a novice, you're not going to do it professionally. It's not going to be for perfect the first time, and that's that's okay. So I actually, preparing for this video, I reached out to some of my former students and said, hey, what, what do you think are some good points that we should talk about? And I had a student give really good feedback, which is I really appreciated the opportunity to develop my own Um, diagnosis, Mm -hmm. my own uh, treatment plan, and present that with constructive feedback. Because sometimes I was wrong, but if you ask leading questions to kind of reframe my thoughts and get me to the right place and the right way to take care of this patient, I grew. I That helped. Constructive criticism that brings us to a safe plan of care. Mm -hmm. I think is really the goal. Don't shut down. Keep asking questions. Keep learning. Keep pushing forward. Keep engaging to learn. Um, So I wanted to end this by describing to you the best students we've ever had. Um, And there have been a lot. We've had some amazing people come through our group. And uh, you pointed out earlier, I think maybe we were talking sidebar, that 
one of the best things about precepting is developing relationships and new friends. Mm -hmm. And particularly when they stay in our own health system, we now have these new colleagues that we have intimate relationships with. So it really benefits all of us so much. You know, it benefits the patient. Mm -hmm. right? So much networking for me has happened in students that I've precepted who then got hired in our hospital system in another service line. Mm -hmm. And so I have close friends in neurology, in vascular surgery, in cardiology, in yeah. trauma surgery, in general surgery. I have lots of networking friends. And I'll tell you, the person that benefits the most from that, it's the patient every For sure. time. For sure. I would definitely agree with that. Um, so the strongest student that I ever had, um, I was with the longest, obviously that goes without saying, the more time you spend with someone, the more invested you're going to be into their growth. But someone that started from a place of a lot of fear, um, a lot of discomfort, a lot of pain points we had to address and needed pushing. But this person came in with the right attitude, with the right level of engagement, with the right level of communication and the perfect amount of professionalism with excellent balances. And throughout the course of our time together, watching her grow from that place to where she is currently, and I'm gonna to have to have her on here so that we can talk about where she's at in her early phase of her journey working as an NP is so incredibly rewarding. But qualities that she demonstrated that stood out that made me really truly invest more time and energy into her to fight for her to help her find a job, to help get her to her dream job, um, I'm going to be more engaged in the person who gives more back to me. So this person was always on time. She always went above and beyond. She was scared, but she rose above her fear and actively sought out more learning opportunities. Every assignment I ever said, hey, go home and learn about this and come back. She came back and she did it. Um, just truly showed enthusiasm for what we do. Clearly said from the get-go, this is what I want to do. I recognize it may be hard to get into this field, but I will do everything it takes to learn this specialty and did it. Um, just there was never ever any friction. There was never any pain points. None of these issues that we said don't do ever happen because she came in with the mindset of I'm scared to freaking death, but I'm going to learn it. I'm going to be the best NP student I can be and I hope to get into this field and she has done so. I'm so proud. So, you know, I think some things that stand out for me is people that are excited to be there. Absolutely. Engagement. They come in and enthused. Like, I, I mean, literally coming in in the morning and saying, I am so excited to be here. I've been waiting for this. I love critical care. I'm so excited that you took me. I'm so excited to start. I really want to learn about this or that. Um, just being enthusiastic about our day that comes sure. so far really does. Um, and I think enthusiasm above everything probably is the number one standout and then being willing to do the hard stuff mm -hmm. the learning the reading something you're right I certainly am learning something every day so sometimes there's an issue that crop, crops up where I'm like hey you know what would help is if you go figure this out I wish you'd come back and teach me because I need to understand this better too. So can you figure this out and let's learn it together. Mm -hmm. Wow, I learned so much by them mm -hmm. doing the digging mm -hmm. and, and uh, bringing that and back And also that's me. a big piece of learning, right? I mean, I can't spoon, spoon feed everything to you. you we don't, we're not spoon fed anymore. No. When we are encountering something new or something we haven't seen in a while, we have to re-educate ourselves. So that is a part of your lifelong journey as an NP too. So it will be expected that you have to do some independent self-education. This is just going to be part of it. Um, definitely. But I think to your point of um, enthusiasm, I did a lot of rotations, like I said before, where I, I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to go into that field, mm -hmm. but I showed up prepared to ask a lot of questions. I had done some background research on what they do, and I had well thought out things to talk about. And the response I got from those people was like, wow, she's actually interested in this, um, speaks volumes about the type of students who normally come through there. So when you do that, you set yourself above and beyond all the other competition. So um, I ended up getting five verbal, five verbal and two written, well, a total of five, three, three of which were verbal and two written offers when I was doing rotations because that's the attitude I went in with. And I'm not saying I'm the ideal student in any way, shape or form. I hope this gave you some really helpful information to help you grow and go with more confidence into your rotations. And if you're gonna come through with critical care, we'll see you soon. Proliferative student <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
to to a patient. Sh uh, uh, whoops, I was <laughs> <laughs> And take two. That was good. You were doing good. I was just like, I'm just like, I just go, blah. I ain't lying for me. I certainly ain't lying for you. <laughs> we really are nice. We really are nice. I promise. <laughs> uh, don't lie.